It's been a long time coming, but finally, after a lot of work by the International Dark Sky Association, NAILS President Matt Thiesing, the Board of Directors and its management, we now have a memorandum of understanding with the International Dark Sky Association to um, educate and promote dark sky values within the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, Greg. Very important initiative, something I'm excited about, and we're going to get after it right here and now. Let's go. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people look at this issue from a perspective, Greg, of like, oh, God, the birds can fly over there, man. I love that thing, you know, 5,000K, but I think there's an ethical case that people are missing. And so, you know, you and I contacted our old friend, uh, Jane Slade, works for a company called Spec Lines. More importantly, she's a non-nailed member, Dark Sky Advocate, and her and I are going to put together five or six shows to make the ethical case to distributors and the industry at, as, as a whole that we should turn towards Dark Sky and start working towards it. Very important thing. I think everybody needs to get on board and learn more about it. And I know these are going to be good ones. So, and you know, to see them. yeah, folks, you know, Nail is about the prosperity of the independent lighting distributor. That's what we're focused on. And so we're not talking about, we're talking about igniting another lighting boom. We're talking about doing the right thing. We're talking about restoring our skies to something that we had 50, 60, 100 years ago. Yeah, it's possible. We know how to do it now. You know what's really great, Greg? What's that? I love the reception we've had within Nailed for this. And you go to a company like Keystone, which is not known for outdoor lighting, and also not known for um, Dark Sky. You approach Josh and the, the people at Keystone. Say, look, Nailed's taking a turn towards Dark Sky. We want to get involved in this. And Keystone jumps right in. How awesome is that? It is. It's, it tells you that they're innovative and they're looking ahead at more than just you know, getting lighting product in the marketplace, they're looking at putting the right stuff out there. And now that they're new to the outdoor fixture market, uh, they have some dark sky friendly product already, in it, but they are committed to making dark sky compliant fixtures going forward for exterior. So it's exciting. It's exciting, you know, and I just really believe over the next three to five years as Nailed works at the this memorandum of understanding, which is a five-year deal that we, we're working with the IDA on that we're really going to start. We're not going to, no one's going to get, we're not going to subtract anything. We're all about positives. We're all about making more money and doing the right thing. So go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com, man. Keep it easy. Light made easy with Keystone Technologies. Thanks to you guys for sponsoring this. But for right now, check it out. Jane Slade and I talking Dark Sky. Hello, Nailed members. Um, one of the things that we've done a lot over the last 10 or 15 years is changed a lot of outdoor lighting. And... Unfortunately, over that period, the industry made a lot of mistakes. And there was an opportunity to really solve another problem that wasn't addressed. And recently, the IES has come out of, with five principles for responsible outdoor lighting. And so the board of directors has asked that Get a Grip Studios and the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast produce a series of podcasts making the ethical case for responsible outdoor lighting. Not the technical case. So we're going to produce a bunch of technical modules in the new LS Evolve, which will discuss how we go about doing responsible outdoor lighting and engaging and, and, and buying into the principles of the International Dark Sky Association. And then how to install those in the field. And there's going to be a bunch of educational modules. This show between Jane Slade and I, um, who is a non-nailed member, Dark Sky Advocate, will be to make the ethical case to you guys and gals about why you should buy in to this right now. Hello, Jane Slade. Hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here and talk about a subject that is extremely passionate for me. Yeah, I mean, I've never met anyone whose passion for Dark Sky exceeded my own until I met you. And you and I bumped into each other at the Illuminating Engineering um, Society's annual convention in 2019. And we just stopped our conversation and decided that it should be recorded. Do you remember that? I do, because we were at the... 
horse track. What was that called? The Kentucky Derby, wherever they do the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, I think it is. the Kentucky Derby was, and we were overlooking the horse track. So it was a, it's kind of an unforgettable moment. It's it not really very is. Often with someone like that. So. Yeah, and then yes. boom! Next thing you know, you're like you're you're talking about issues. Why? Yes. So I want to talk first about maybe should I, maybe I'll ask this question first because we want people to be drawn in here. Why should lighting distributors? And I have my own opinions too, so I'm going to come at you pretty hot too. Why should lighting distributors? Um, actually, no. I'm going to ask you this. Have we have the, has the dark sky advocacy movement accomplished its goals amongst the lighting designers and that and specifiers of which that's your field, right? Absolutely not. We are lacking awareness. And if you want to come in hot with the question, I I can take it, which is, well, how are lighting distributors going to make money if there's dark sky advocacy, which No, is I know how they're going to make money. I already know. Okay, I already great. got I already know that. I already got, we have a plan for that. But what I want to know is why should they care? Because the problem with them, with us lighting distributors, me, me included, we have a very hard time selling dark sky, uh, dark sky outdoor lighting, which is, um, which is, uh, compliant with the five principles as set out by the IES and the IDEA. We have a very hard time about that. And most of it is because of, um, People that just don't care or don't know okay. they should care. Why? So the thing is, is that brightness sells, but it is a very short-sighted desire that is met. And the truth is, is that I've never seen anyone walk away from a fireside saying, I'm extremely stressed out. When we operate in full brightness from the moment we wake up until the moment we turn out that bedside lamp. That is associated with a to-do list and never-ending tasks. It is terrible for the human psyche. And I'm just speaking about the human element of it. There's a whole other side of how we're impacting wildlife, which people do care. People are not monsters. They care. But I can get to that as well. But there's an unexpected benefit that happens when you turn the lights out at dusk and let the dusk come into your space. And instead of turning lights on, you turn a candle on and you have dinner with a candlelight. So there's a lot to care about. And I think that the term dark skies is not necessarily always helping the movement because it's talking about something that most people can't experience anyway, but you can experience dimmer light levels that are better for your psyche that allow you to bring in different types of thought. And, you know, so... Here, here's, I'm going to throw out a proposition to you and I want to ask you if you agree with me. Okay. Okay. So the, and I'm going to throw out some historical things that are not completely accurate, but make my point. Okay. So every 12,500 years, the Sphinx in Egypt is orientated to the star sign or whatever the technical term is, but that could be 10,000. I don't know what the exact amount of years is, but every certain amount of years exactly, it orientates itself to the Leo star sign on the summer equinox. Wow. And it's not, that's it not an accident. It's not an accident. Yeah. And at the same time, I don't know if that's a 10,000 or whatever. There's something to do with Leo. It's a lion. There's something to do with Leo and the stars. And then at the mm -hmm. same time, and I don't know if this is a hundred, but there's some sort of combination of this kind of thing that's out there. The great Pisa, Pisa, uh, Great uh, Pyramid in Giza is aligned with the center of Orion's belt. Yes. Or something like that. Crazy, ridiculous calculation that we can't even do today. Our ancestors, like we have a relationship with the night sky and darkness as every other animal on earth does. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Well, I do, but our relationship with the particular map of the stars is not really needed anymore uh, in terms of the fact that we have geolocators in our pockets at all times. It used to be vital for us as navigators, but it's no longer needed, unfortunately. We've surpassed that information. It is still a first line of defense for wildlife. So... Dung beetles astro-navigate, birds, whales, a ton of different organisms use it as a way to find their path on the planet. How do they do and that? 
Well, there's multiple different geomagnetic mechanisms. So for birds, they have a mechanism in their brain and actually it's coupled with light. So when a red light is shown, actually it can interfere with a bird's ability to take off in the right direction. So it's actually coupled. And there's a study on that, which I can share with any listeners who want to hear more about it. But um, basically, if you've ever used a compass, you know that it does not work at very well everywhere. It works pretty well most places. So there needs to be supplemental ways to navigate. So animals developed ways to actually use the stars, the sun and the moon to find their way. So that can be interfered with by light, not only just blanching the night sky so that it's no longer visible, but also it can actually interfere with the mechanisms that take place inside the animal body, in which case we're talking about the birds. So, but what, can I, can I throw something back at you here that I I think occurred to me and, you know, maybe I'm, I'm completely crazy, but, um, I think there's a star relationship to with that humans have that is not just about geolocation or finding their way around the earth, but is also about humility and awe and something that blows your mind. Like I've never seen anybody walk off the dock of my parents' cottage or my or my um or my uh, my mother and father in law's dock at the cottage on a starry night, saying, "Yeah, that's bullshit." They're always blown away. There's something spiritual that's deeper, and maybe we lose our way as well. And that's yeah. my point. Like maybe there's a like maybe we're underestimating our re- like in a sense. What I've learned from the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast is that darkness is really light too. In a way, we need it. it. Absolutely is. Yes, constant brightness is not doing us any favors. I actually just took myself on a two-week writing sabbatical to Maine where I was in a dark sky place. There was a dock, and I went out every single night. I interacted with beavers who, by the way, are nocturnal and monogamous for life, and there were two beavers, and they got used to me over the time that I was there, and I looked out at the stars, and I could truly feel my thinking change from a to-do list to a much more uh, philosophical place just through the time of sitting out on the dock looking at the stars. And I think that we are missing this. And it doesn't seem necessarily important on a day-to-day basis when we're dealing with larger, bigger problems. But I think we never separate ourselves from our problems to get any perspective and that we're really losing ourselves in our to-do lists when we never get to see the stars. In Canada, Canadians often travel north to cottages and, and this sort of thing to experience nature. And part of that is a d- deep darkness that they mm-hmm. experience, like a, a shutting off of the lights, a shutting down, a disconnection from technology. And, you know, I'm, I don't want to walk this path too much, but there's people in America that have never seen the stars for sure. That's absolutely true because eight out of 10 school children don't see the stars as they were. And I can also tell you, I went to college in Canada and there were many trips that we've taken from Toronto up North. And I will say in general, there is a deeper connection to nature on the whole for Canadians as a nation than there is in the United States. And that we used to go to this little mink lake in Canada, in Ontario, (laughs) there was no power, everything. um, We had to bring in all the water and me and my college friends, we had an amazing time. I mean, there was absolutely no electricity and it was amazing. So I do think that there is a disconnection from the night sky and that is really impacting people's thinking. The royal family owns of England, which is the monarch of Canada, still owns land somewhere up north in Ontario where they go. The royals go there. Um, the princes go there. And they spend time there to, to ground themselves and to see the world. And so I think we need to, um, as, a, as a species, um, include ourselves in the earth as the living things on the earth 
that need darkness. And there was a principle in the um, the um, memorandum of understanding between Nailed and um, International Dark Sky Association about the relationship that we want to have and, and start to mm. educate distributors that talked about the heritage of the night sky. I found that very powerful, Jane. Mm. The heritage, it's part of our heritage as humans. Mm. Yeah. Light more than any other factor, more than any other environmental factor has been the factor that's tied our connection year over year to the planet. So if you think about temperature, it changes periodically. You have El Nino, you have the ice ages, you have different temperatures that occurred and they were not similar in different periods, but light was always the same. And so that has tuned interactions between species, nudging these uh, interactions between all of the species on the planet into place. And light starts, when we shine light at night, that actually messes with this age old language that we've had. And for humans too, we have had this connection to dusk and dawn and the timing of that shifting, but you know, how, how often does the average person experience dusk and dawn without electric light? I Not wonder, I wonder if darkness would be more, he- like if people talk about healthy lighting, I wonder if more darkness is just the answer, right? Like, you know, they talk about, oh, we're going to make a new light fixture that's healthy and it's going to help you. Do I have to wear sunglasses? Is it like it's have UV? I mean, you know, the same issues that you hear about outside, you know, and you're thinking, oh, now I'm, you know, whatever. But I mean, maybe darkness is the answer. Maybe it's the absence of light that we need to heal ourselves. It's, we are not going to go around not using light. We absolutely need light. We've just lost our sense of the balance. And actually I have an article coming out in LDNA magazine in November. And what I say is that one of the problems we're suffering from is the expression, if I have have a hammer, then everything is a nail. Mm -hmm. And so as lighting designers, we have failed to experience um, the other side of our tool belt, which is darkness and also the natural daylight cycle. Cause it's not just about light and dark. It's mm-hmm. about that arc and that beautiful arc of light. Mm-hmm. And I actually have my own practice of not turning the lights on at dusk and allowing that dusky light to come in. Mm. And when you look at that dusky sky, that gradient, that screen of fading light, it's absolutely stunning. And it offers something that even though you probably can't see the stars, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and my mom had called me recently this week and she said, there's a beautiful uh, star shower tonight. And I said, well, there's no way I could see it. But even without that, the experience of a dusky sky is enough to create uh, a lot of beauty. Beauty matters, actually. And, yes. you know, it, you know, well, I'm not talking about sexy nail distributors, okay, which is a, which is a different thing talking about awe-inspiring beauty um we we don't experience that enough in our lives anymore and our ancestors always had access to that every uh, not every night because sometimes it's cloudy but on a regular basis they had access to awe-inspiring beauty and the monuments that our ancestors built to this beauty that are aligned with stars and suns and setting of suns on certain days is is something we need to consider now in the age of bad discourse in the age of um, environmental problems. We need, we need something to take us out of ourselves. You know, and Jane, you know, it's interesting because you, you read about anthropology. All around the world, people would take their best lamb and they would burn it on a pyre and they would send the smoke up to heaven because they were inspired by the, the sky and the stars and the sun and the moon. Mm-hmm. And that was important to their lives. Like if you went back then to, to our answer, and I'm not talking about 30 million years ago or a hundred thousand years ago, I'm talking about 300 years ago or 250 years ago or 50 or 50 years ago 
as more people had a relationship with a dark sky, they were able to assess their life better. This is a super important issue from a spiritual perspective, from a, a point of view. People need to understand that there is something about the beauty and the awe that people feel when they're in that environment that changes them permanently. Absolutely. Yeah, and if you, the amount of trouble that the Egyptians went through to build the pyramids of Giza, I believe it's um, 2.5 million tons of stone that it's were ridiculous. carried more than 500 miles away all in reverence to the night sky. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we don't experience every day. And, you know, look, Netflix is great. I wouldn't not have Netflix, but there are other ways of connecting to a deeper place that we have completely taken out of our lives. And I think that that missingness is creating a real problem because we're only disconnecting more and more because we don't even know what we're missing anymore. I actually believe that this is the most important, like, <laughs> okay, all you listeners out there, I actually believe that this is the most important environmental issue and that if we solve it, if we, if people can be in awe on a regular basis of the nature sure. and the world they live in, like... We're on a wet rock spinning around at 14,000 kilometers an hour around a, a hot nuclear fission reaction. And that's spinning around the galaxy at a hundred. Like it's, it, the numbers start to get wacky. There's something about this place that needs the balance of darkness and the night sky. And, and the reason why the birds and the turtles and, oh, who cares about the turtles? Well, okay. I care about the turtles, but really what I'm seeing is not an individual turtle dying. It's a tragedy actually. It's a tragedy. And we can solve this. It's act not only is it the most important issue in my mind, because it will ground humans again in the universe, the awe of the universe again. So they can say, what are we doing? Why are we being so greedy and selfish? Look at how blessed we are that we're conscious alive in this earth. But not only that, but that, you know, we're affecting this life here. And we're, why are we doing this? We can, so, it's such an easy problem to solve. It is. We have every tool to solve it. The, what we're lacking is awareness. People don't know. And I would totally agree with you that light pollution is completely underestimated as for what the impact it's creating in our lives and in animal and plant lives. And I could get into a lot of the studies about what's happening with animals and plants. But, you know, when we talk about global warming or we talk about the plastic islands and the oceans, people get really concerned. But light pollution, the term just doesn't sound like that big of a deal until you realize what you're taking away from the ecosystem. But the funny thing is, of all the types of pollution, if the power went out right now, it would all go away just like that. So we have the ability to solve this instantaneously. And really what that means is that we have to change our thinking. We need a paradigm shift. And, mm -hmm. and like the other problems, I, I've talked a lot about this on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast when people start to talk about mitigations of climate change. I'm sick of mitigating. You can't mitigate your way out of water shortages. You can't mitigate, you can't save your water, you save the water out of a water source shortage. Either you have enough water flowing to that area, or you don't. You can't mitigate your way out of climate change. Mitigations will only take you so far. What we need is clean electricity. And so we can use as much of it as we want. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, that there's no worry about, oh, I can't, you know, a Dutch, blah, blah, blah. no, just so we can go back to abundance and a lifestyle of abundance. And, you know, and the whole plastics issue, you know, we need a way to deal with plastics. But I think the reason why people like there's, there's, they've gone from st at night staring at the stars and saying, you know, I'm just another piece of this, just a little tiny piece of this universe. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And especially now, it's even more powerful now because we know how crazy the numbers are of those stars, you know? And like this, that one over there is a hundred million light years away. Like what do you, how did that light get here? The time. Yeah. And so you, you think, you, oh, you only have this amount of time. And so what are you going to do with your life? 
You know, the problem is that we're never in awe of the universe. We've gone from staring at the night sky, looking at fires and relating with one another, turning off the to-do list, to staring at these screens, which are just stress makers every night. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. has consequences. Yes. It is having dire consequences on our stress and anxiety levels. And it's also changing our thinking to never have that perspective. Uh, in my uh, free time, I'm a yoga teacher and I bring in a lot of meditation into my classes. And I'm always asking of myself and of my students to take a step back from the waterfall of thought and just be the watcher of it. Instead of being the movie, watch the movie and have a little bit of distance. And what that night sky was doing was giving us that vantage on our own experience as a being, as a living thing. Because suddenly we could step away and see how tiny we were, if only for that time underneath the stars. And I think that lack is creating a real disconnect in what is really important in our lives. Have you ever had a, one of your students ask to turn the lights up during a motivation, uh, meditation? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, or a yoga class? That... You turn them down, right? When you're ready to relax. Yeah, you turn them down. You turn them down. Yeah. You know, when you want to be, no, the, no, no. when you want to be the observer, I, when you want to be the observer right. of your thoughts, right? When you want to step back and our ancestors had this opportunity to do it naturally way more than we do. Mm -hmm. They did. They experienced dawn. They were hunting and gathering under the zenith, which is the bluest light, noon, and then they came back to dusk, the warm orangey light. And then they built a fire, a red light fire, and they went to bed when the fire was out. And that was our experience with light. It was extremely natural and it had an arc and we were active during the bluest light and we became um, quieter during the dim light and finally went to sleep. That's how we experienced light. From my uh, time with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast and various scientists, um, what I've noticed is that the one thing that all of them say is that humans are not a nocturnal species. Hmm. Okay, like, and I, I kind of summed that up in my own. And, mm -hmm. but like, that's, that's kind of what they're saying. Right? Like, it's like, okay, we can do this, and, blah, 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 and when we do this, but like, you need to sleep at night when it's dark, and you need to be awake during the day, and you need to be outside. These things are very healthy for you. And the thing that kind of pushed me over the edge on that was Andrea Wilkerson's um, uh, uh, cueing study, where she actually accidentally figured out that instead of in the NICU wards, Instead of like turning on the lights in the morning and coming in when everybody's sleeping and all this sort of stuff, if they just started the light at a dim, low Kelvin temperature and raised the Kelvin temperature slowly over the course of the hour and increased the light level, when the nurses came in in the morning, everybody was already awake and feeding. They had already woken mm -hmm. up on their own, right? This idea of mm -hmm. queuing, and I'm like, oh God, come on. It's got to be something to do with the sun rising and setting. I mean, like, you know, it's, that's like tricking rats to wake up. Like we can do that with rats. We know that of course we work the same way, Jane. Of course we do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard about that NICU study and you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, once you know, it's so obvious, but they basically started bringing the natural daylight cycle into the NICUs for the tiny little infants. And once they did that, the infants did a lot better, especially when the infants went home because previously the infants had been in constant brightness. And then when they went home with mom and dad, it would be dark at night. And that was very, very jarring, which would make sense. That would be extremely terrifying. So it seems really sensical once you know that the NICU should observe a natural daylight cycle, but it was not initially, uh, you know, the most prioritized uh, design um, initiative because people would just wanted to address what the infants needed in terms of an emergency situation. But I will say, yes, humans are nocturnal, but I, I will say that we all have different chronotypes and that I myself am on the more nocturnal end. And they refer to this, the more nocturnal people as the tribe watchers. So 
there's really early morning people. Wow. One one thing I'll never be. I just does not work for me. <laughs> um, but but there there's also sort of this sense that you know early morning people are the the best people. But that's not actually true. We actually need all chronotypes for society to run to run, and especially when we were more navigating with tri as tribes. But the the tribe watcher would stay up, watch the fire, make sure there was no animals coming in. That was a very important role. And and so some people we do... some people were good at it. Yes, yes. And then you know in daily life where that comes into place is that we have actually shift workers. So the nurses who are watching the tribe members who are sick. So that's super important too. And we've also learned through studies that when we took the natural daylight cycle to the corridors of hospitals, that shift workers did much better. Incidentally, shift workers have a higher incidence of cancer. So the light at night that they're receiving and then going back to their daily lives and shifting their, their circadian clocks so wildly can be really hard. But I do think that we can bring that more into our designs of how we bring lighting in, um, light levels especially. We've covered a lot, 30 minutes here. Um, so I think, I think you know, what we're going to try to do, um, the Port of Nailed has asked us to produce this, and um, we immediately thought of you as the person to really uh, we've been follow Scott follows you. He's seen your articles. We've we you know obviously we re-released uh, the podcast we did with you at the IES a couple weeks ago. Um, and so what we want to do with this, Jane, if that's okay with you, is we want mm -hmm. to really get into the hearts and minds of distributors and appeal to their. I I want to make it so so right now if you talk to a nail distributor and you talk about like fluorescent lamps or H HPS or something like that. They, there's a there's a certain number of them that will turn their nose up at that and they'll say, I don't, I only sell OED. You know, I don't really mm -hmm. get into that old stuff anymore. That's for the old guys. Now, who knows what they actually do? Maybe they're shipping tons of that stuff. Who knows at the end of the day? But I want to make it, I think the first step here is to really tell people that the best thing, real thing you can do to help the environment right now as a distributor, like if you care about climate change or you're environmentally sensitive or you're not actually, and you like nature or you're a hunter or a fisherman or whatever, this is not political in any way, shape or form. It doesn't have a democratic bent or a Republican bent or conservative or liberal or anything. What we're saying here is that you can help the planet by making it dark at night or in bi building on those five principles. And Jane and I are going to discuss the reasons why you should do that. From an ethical perspective, a moral perspective, and you know, hopefully yeah. one day some compliance, some legal perspective, that the mm -hmm. you know the government we can move it that way. Jane, I'd like to invite you to help guys like me, letting distributors, the people in Nailed, get it figured out. Is that okay? Well, I just want to say thank you so much for thinking of me. I really appreciate it, and it is one of my great passions in life to share this information. I truly believe that once you think along these lines, you can't go back. And that the loss is everyone's equally. It's not just for people who want to advocate for the environment. There is something we are all missing in our daily lives. And we don't know what we're missing anymore. So hopefully with this podcast, we'll be able to really bring back this idea of connecting to the natural daylight cycle in its natural form. I'm excited, Jane. Let's do it. Me too. <laughs> Keystone Technologies, my man. K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. Keeping it easy. Light made easy, Greg. They have their XFIT outdoor fixtures right now. New to the marketplace. Some of them are dark sky friendly. Uh, but as we said at the beginning, they're continuing to innovate and make new exterior product. And they're committed to making dark sky compliant, dark sky friendly fixtures. And really tackling that initiative and, and putting the right light outside, not just any light, the right light. And that's what Keystone's going to be about. You got to go to KeystoneTech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. So awesome them to step up right away and say, you know what? Let's do this thing. Let's get this dark sky thing done. Let's, let's start working on the distributors. Hey, we're talking about a five to 10 year plan here, folks. But we're not talking about anyone getting hurt. We're talking about starting another lighting boom. Why not?
Let's do it, folks. There's a lot of work to be done out there if dark sky gets taken seriously. And there's areas in the United States, Greg, where it's very important. Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona, it's a dark sky city. Oh, yeah. And then there's an initiative. There's something in Minnesota, too, the, the Boundary Waters and other areas where you want to see the stars again. You want to see the night. That's what you talked about on the show here with Jane. That's what we got to bring back. And we can do that, our part, with the lighting. And if you're a lighting distributor, man, we got, we're, we got, we're coming out with a whole bunch of educational videos on the technical and product side. What to do, how to do it, what is Dark Sky, all that's going to be coming out in Ellis Evolve. So check it out. Thanks for listening.